Thank you for joining us today for our Zoominar on our global ETF portfolios and market strategy with Top Gun Investment Mind, Kevin Vandermeer and Mang Gao. My name is Jeff Hunter. I'm a portfolio manager with the Townsend, Samani and Hunter Group at Canaccord Genuity. Also on the line is our lead investment advisors, Dave Townsend and Raheem Samani. For more information about our team, please check out mywealthmanager.ca. Before we get started, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, today's call will be uh, recorded. Uh, so check your emails in the coming days for the replay information or follow our team's Facebook page at facebook.com slash mywealthmanager.ca. We have more muted participants, but in the chat below, feel free to direct any questions to Dave, Raheem, or myself, and we'd be happy to ask on your behalf. With that, let's get started. Meng, do you wanna quickly provide some background on your team and start from there? Sure, I can. Uh, it's Kevin Vandermeer here. I'm, I'll jump in. Uh, if we can go to the slide presentation. Uh, so very quickly, um, my name is Kevin Vandermeer. I work uh, closely um, with Jeff and, and Dave and Rahim. I am based in Toronto. And uh, what we're going to do today is, is work through very quickly this slide deck that I provided and, and I'm sure will be provided to you uh, after the call. So what I'd like to do is first of all provide you a, a, a global review if you will. So let's get caught up on where, we, uh, where we've been, what sectors have been working, what a asset classes have been working, what's, uh, what commodities have been working. Next we'll give you a bit of an outlook on uh, where we think the markets are going globally. And then finally, we'll leave you with um, an idea or two about how to best position yourself uh, globally. So Ming, if you move to the first slide. And uh, so first of all, let's just look at uh, global markets. I'm sure that all of you are more than aware of the fact that uh, we had a fairly significant and, and quick pullback uh, towards the uh, the end of March. Uh, this pullback was felt um, throughout the world, driven primarily by uh, the pandemic. Really every, uh, every global market was hit and it was one of the fastest pullbacks uh, anybody's seen, seen since 1987. What's almost uh, as impressive as the pullback is, is the speed at which um, global markets have, have bounced. And uh, what's perhaps most surprising and what I want to take a, you to take away from this slide is that China and the US, despite the fact that these are two, um, two of the largest economies in the world and currently at odds with each other, uh, are, are two of the best performing markets in the world. And uh, China obviously was hit first by this pandemic, but has, 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 has fared very well and uh, it really one of the first to come out of this um, this and is one of the one of the strongest. So this really argues to, you know, wanting to be globally diversified, wanting to have exposure around the world because it's not always clear what markets uh, are are, are going to perform o over what period of time. Next slide. Now, if we drill down, this is a U.S. market, and what we've done is um, we have. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm taking a call here. Um, if we look at the, the individual sectors um, within the S&P 500, so this is all of, uh, all, all of the 10 sectors, uh, it should be no surprise to anybody that technology has really been one of the strongest, was one of the strongest sectors going into the pandemic and has really come out of that strong. There's a number of reasons for that. Obviously, the fact that we're all working from home, using technology like we are right now on Zoom, um, that has really benefited the kind of the, what they call the stay at home economy. So that would include the likes of Google, Microsoft, Amazon. Um, so those kind of tech heavy, if you will, sectors have, and companies have benefited. And then energy is, is, has been one of the more challenging areas. Um, so again, and then consumer discretionary, um, as well as healthcare and, commu and um, communications. Uh, have also been some of the stronger sectors, uh, not only coming out of this uh, 
a, a market pullback. If we look now to Canada, what has done well in Canada? Uh, not surprising, again, the technology sector is leading, um, but closely behind that is, is materials. And um, when we think of materials, we often think of copper or we might think of, um, you, you know, sort of other base metals, but really what's driving the material sector in Canada is gold. Um, gold has been strong, and we'll show you a, sh a, a chart of that shortly, but uh, gold stocks have really benefited uh, through this piece. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And then um, healthcare, which is primarily the cannabis space and energy have been the real sectors that have lagged. Um, they were, as you can see on this chart, they were somewhat challenged before the pandemic and then have not really participated in the, in the recovery. Next slide, please. If we look at commodities, you know, what has been working, what is, has held up, uh, it's been gold. Uh, followed by silver. Silver has um, kind of fallen back and not kept pace uh, with gold. And that's primarily because silver is used um, more in, uh, in industrial uh, uses. And obviously when the economy is a little bit softer, we see less of, um, less of a benefit in, in demand for silver. Uh, then we saw you know, natural gas and obviously W2AI or, or oil when the when the entire global economy is put on pause, obviously we're not driving, we're not manufacturing, and, um, and if, as long as we're somewhat still producing, we're gonna be oversupplied. And that's why we saw in, in, in an unusual situation, actually oil went briefly uh, negative. If we look at the next slide. Now just turning to fixed income, you know, what has held up when equity markets um, pull back, in a portfolio, we would hope that our fixed income uh, would, would hold in and, and hang in there and, and provide a kind of a break, um, be, be much more defensive. And really, we've seen that. Um, if you look at government bonds around the world, whether it's U.S. Treasuries or you know, Canadian government bonds, really held up well, you know, checked back a little bit, but, but came back. And then you can see now that corporate bonds are, are really taking the lead. And then high yield, which is the kind of uh, riskier portion of, of fixed income. Those are companies that um, you know, maybe are, are stretching a little bit or, or in sectors that are somewhat challenged. You can see that high yield um, is also recovering. Took a, a much bigger hit than obviously government bonds or, or um, highly rated corporate bonds. Um, next slide. So, that gives you a kind of a quick overview of what's happened around the world. Um, you know, it's been one of the most uh, challenging periods in time. And uh, certainly in my career, I've, I've you know, worked uh, professionally through 2008, but um, certainly nobody that's managing money professionally has ever been through a pandemic, uh, which has made it um, somewhat challenging. But now let's turn and, and think about and we've given you a review of what's happened, but now let's start to think about what do we do now going forward? You, many of you um, on the line right now may be in cash. Many of you might be worried that the market's gone up a lot. You know, wh where do we go from here? So one of the things that we like to do as professionals is we like to go back and look at um, scenarios that are similar to the one that we just experienced. So we will go back and try to find as many times as possible in history and, and lay those um, situations on top of each other to get um, a, an approximation of where the market might go. So in this case and in this slide, what we see here is we're, we're, we're mapping um, approximately 20, um, call them bull, bear markets, uh, where the markets pull back and then really rallied coming off the bottom. And, and that's really what we've seen in the last um, uh, kind of call it six weeks to two months uh, since the bottom, you know, we've, we've had this, what they call breadth, the really strong bounce off the, off the bottom. And typically there's a bit of a pause. And um, so then after we've had this big move and a pause, what does the market typically do? And as you can see from this analog, it typically goes up kind of maybe another 10 to 15%. And 
I, I admit, you know, if you're, if you're not a, um, you're, you're not in the weeds every day, like uh, many of us are, it, it's a really hard thing to imagine that the market's up, you know, kind of 38 to 40% and the market could go further, but history is our guide. And clearly from this graph and just looking at the data, uh, we feel like the market could go higher. So this is an analog, this, this work and these analogs were done on the US market. Now let's turn to Canada, which is the next slide. And we can see that um, while we don't have as many um, scenarios like we do in the US, um, the story is much the same, that the Canadian market, even after it's had this huge run up and pullback, uh, typically will continue um, to, to, to grind higher over the next uh, six to 12 months. And so as we think about how the market might behave in the back half of this year, uh, we, we remain bullish um, uh, because historically in situations and scenarios like we've been through, the market continues to go. Next slide. What's also amazing about this, um, th this bounce, which has is, is been incredible, is that it's actually the second strongest bounce. So people will often say, okay, I understand that you're looking at history. I understand that you, we've looked at a number of scenarios in the US and Canadian market, but what does it mean when we've had such a strong move off? Like this is really unprecedented. Um, and so we'll look at some data, I think, in the next slide. So again, what we'd like to do is look back and this data has, has been done on the Canadian market. The US data is, is very similar, but because most of us are in Canada right now, we, we went back and we said, okay, can we find a scenario where, you know, in the last 50 days, we've seen a 20% move off the bottom. What happens one month out, you know, three months out, six months out and 12 months out? And you can see that the returns actually are quite, uh, quite reasonable. Uh, and in fact, you know, are, are sort of in the double digits, if you will. Um, and we, we used the data, we went back as far as we could to get clean data on this move. And you can see when you go back as far as um, 1982, we've had, um, I think it's here, a total of um, six scenarios where the, the markets move um, at least 20%. And then it continues to move, and you know, with with a certain level of um, uh, you know, the probabilities are still very high, even six months out. So there's an 83 percent chance, as you can see in that in that third or, or, or um, second last column to the right, um, you know, the, the average return might be 10 percent, um, with an 83 percent chance of being uh, positive. So. Again, playing probabilities, being uh, data-driven, uh, we, we feel fairly confident that you wanna be uh, still long this market and, and, and wanna, um, if you are invested, stay invested. If you're not invested, we would encourage you to at least put some capital to work. Next slide. So one of the things that makes us so positive is um, there's still a lot of cash on the sidelines. And this graph was put together. It shows the amount of money that's um, that's still in in uh, in money market funds. So uh, we that's easily um, available. That data is easily available and can be easily tracked. And so um, having cash on the sidelines that hasn't been invested means that there's still um, people that are are likely to enter the market um, that are likely to to buy equities that need to buy equities. And uh, so this is kind of, if you will, the, the firepower, the, um, the, you know, sort of the uh, what could propel or, or we're expecting push the market higher. You can see that the cash levels are in fact higher than they were in 2008. So still a, a fairly good measure of uh, an element of fear in the market or uncertainty. And um, we would see that as a positive um, for why, why equity markets might go higher. If we look at the next slide, and this is a, a little bit more of a, a um, maybe a confusing slide, but um, 
obviously there's lots of different kinds of participants in the market. There are people that think the market will go up and, and be long the market. There's other people that think the market will go down and they'll short the market. And uh, so what we see here is we see um, this graph and you can see that it's quite red. There's a number of hedge funds um, in the market that are, are fairly confident or ha have a view um, that the market's gonna go down. And many hedge funds have been really hurt this year. There are some very, very sophisticated um, hedge funds have bet that the market um, will go down. That hasn't been the case. Their performance um, has, has lagged the market um, considerably. And so these individuals are gonna also need to buy back in their positions or what's called cover. And so this again is another catalyst for why we believe the market's gonna go higher. Um, people that are short the market are going to have to cover. And again, this is another um, really kind of simple way of looking at the market. Um, it's it's uh, sort of a data-driven uh, rationale for why the market could go higher in the back half of this year. Next slide. Probably one of the most uh, asked questions or the questions that I get asked the most is, you know, when are we going to get back to normal? What will this normal look like? And I'm sure that many of you, uh, like myself, are, are wondering the same thing. And, and uh, so I, I put this slide in the presentation. This slide really tracks air traffic. But if you think about air traffic and, and us, um, whether it's for business or pleasure, it's, it's um, traveling is, is highly discretionary. And um, so what this graph is suggesting is that by next year, sort of June of next year or July of next year, you know, air traffic will return. And that's probably a fairly good gauge of how long it's gonna take this economy um, or the economies in North America and Canada to kind of get back to normal. Um, so, you know, we are improving, we are moving in the right direction. And if you detract something that's highly discretionary like business travel or air travel, um, you can see that it's recovering. And in many ways, this is a, um, if you will, a micro, microcosm or um, view of kind of what the economy is doing and how it's doing. Um, and, and we think, you know, eventually we'll, we'll survive this pandemic, the world will um, normalize and, uh, you know, we'll eventually get back to normal. If we look at the next slide, and I like to, I like to show this slide in presentations because, and, you know, it's, it's reasons to sell. And I, I won't go through all of the, um, the reasons that are listed here, but um, you know, it's sort of the title's obviously tongue in cheek. You know, you can, you can, we can come up with lots of reasons why you shouldn't be in the market. Um, there's always a reason, whether it's um, you know, two, two large economies negotiating or renegotiating trade deals, whether it's the default on, um, you know, you think of back to Greece, when they were defaulting on their, um, on their credit. You think of um, scenarios where countries were at odds with each other, whether it's a shock in oil. Um, there's, there's, there's always gonna be challenges around the world. And, but yet, you know, sort of capitalism prevails. Entrepreneurs um, find new ways to do business. And, um, and, and event, you know, the, the market does, you know, kind of grind higher over time. And so, the key message really here is, um, despite all of the no noise, despite all of the challenges, you want to be, you want to stay invested, and benefit in some way um, from the market, um, regardless of how bad the news is and, and how bad it, it might be. So now we're going to we're going to pivot a bit and, and think about, you know, we've we've talked about kind of giving you an outlook, an overview of of the, the world, showed you that China is doing well showed you that the US is, is doing well. We've, we've looked at the sectors, you know, the technology sectors strong, the materials, primarily gold is doing strong, commodities are doing strong. Uh, we've showed you that, you know, some of the strongest um, bonds around the world are primarily sovereign debt as well as corporate. And then we've given you kind of an outlook in terms of how we think that the world will unfold in the next six to 12 months. We've tried to be very process driven and data driven as we've showed you previous scenarios uh, and, and not necessarily 
you know, talked about stimulus, not necessarily talked about the, you know, who's in power, whether it's Biden or, or Trump, but just looked at uh, previous scenarios. And now what we want to do is get you to think a little bit about how you should act or, or ways that you can um, be invested uh, globally. So let's just first look at um, some, again, some data. So I know that most of you on this call are probably, um, probably have most of your portfolio in Canada, and that's called a home country bias. So um, th this is the, the data. If I was in a room uh, with you, I would perhaps go around the room and ask uh, everybody in the room or a couple of you uh, how much you have allocated to Canada. Um, you know, it's just a natural thing. But what's interesting is when you look at Canada in general, it really only represents about 3.4% um, of the, the, the overall uh, world, but yet most of us in Canada would have maybe 60% of our net worth, uh, our investable assets in Canada. So the point of this slide is just to think about the fact that you can invest outside of Canada, that there are real great opportunities outside of Canada. I know that most of you know this, but um, it's, it's uh, kind of a good reminder that, um, you know, our economy and our, our, our representation on the global stage is actually quite small. And this is not something unusual. This is um, entirely consistent. So you can see that if you're in Australia, you have a home country bias, you think Australia is the place to be. Um, but we do have, we, we want you to start thinking of, um, globally. We go to the next slide. This slide um, shows you that when you think about investing outside of Canada and you start to think more globally, um, typically you'll, you'll generate better returns. So if you remember the first slide I started with, I showed you that China was one of the strongest economies over the last year, and, or one of the strongest economies and one of the strongest stock markets followed by the US. And if you, um, we go back to that slide, you would see, or you, you can refer to it later, you'll see that Canada is actually lagging many markets in Canada, it, it, around the world. Here again is basically the historical context for that, that while you we generated decent returns um, over the last sort of 33 years, and this this data stops at 2018, so it's a little bit dated, but the message is still the same that you can generate um, often returns that are better than those that we've generated in Canada by investing outside of Canada. Go to the next slide. If we look here now. Um, at the US market, so often uh, people will say, well, I understand that I can't get, uh, I can get better returns outside of Canada. You know, I'm gonna invest in the US. The US has been the strongest market, continues to be the strongest market. I don't need to invest anywhere else. Well, history will tell you that there are periods of time um, where the US market does underperform. And, uh, you know, I started, in my career in investing in 1999, right in the, um, in the midst of the tech bubble. And um, then the US market underperformed for more than 10 years. And I remember thinking as a, as a junior analyst and as a junior portfolio manager, why would anybody ever invest in the US market? Um, it, it, it's somewhat challenged, you know, it always um, underperforms Canada. And that was before even taking into account um, uh, currency effects, which, which even dampened those returns further. And then I have uh, Ming, who works very closely with me, um, is a tremendous resource for me, but Ming really entered uh, the investment world, you know, kind of in uh, 2012. And all that Ming has experienced is that the U.S. market has done really, really well. And so in Ming's mind, um, obviously he's, he's entered the investment world in a, in a different time and, and all that he has is that the US market outperforms. So, so really what I'm trying to show you here is that anybody that tells you they know, you know when the US market out, may outperform or not, we really don't know. Um, certainly coming out of the credit crisis where you know, the US was really ground zero for much of um, the uh, the, you know, the challenges that were the credit crisis with all that was happening in the U.S. housing market, 
really there was nobody telling you to put your money into the U.S. market. But yet that was the place to be coming out of the credit crisis and has, and has consistently been uh, the place to be. How long that might um, continue, we just don't know. But what I'm arguing for is that you want to have a balanced approach. You want to be invested globally. You want to be as diversified as you can because there are periods of time where you know, Canada will outperform the U.S. There'll be times where the U.S. will outperform uh, global markets. There'll be times where international will outperform or even emerging markets, which is primarily China. Um, so what we would argue is, especially with kind of safe money, we would want you to be as diversified as possible and as global as possible. Um, and so as we look at the next couple of slides here, we've created a, um, a, a variety of products internal at Canaccord, uh, which you can speak to um, your advisors and in, in your team on the line here. But depending on your risk profile, and we fully understand that everybody has, you know, trying to achieve um, different uh, financial goals. There's some of you that are looking to save and, and buy your first home. There are others of you who are um, you know, saving for education or you're saving for your kids' education. And uh, still others are supporting um, you know, aging parents. So everybody has you know, different financial goals that they're attempting to achieve. And we understand that you have different risk profiles. And so we've really created kind of six versions of the same product, but in this, in this uh, portfolio, this global portfolio, we're going to give you exposure to Canada, the U.S., international markets, as well as short-term um, fixed income and long-term fixed income. And then within that, we've tilted to the strongest parts of each of those markets. So if you go back and look at what were the strongest markets in the U.S., they were technology. We have a technology uh, tilt in our U.S. bucket. What are the strongest sectors in Canada? They're technology and gold. In materials, but specifically gold. And as a result, we have a tilt there to gold and, and technology. So in the portfolio, you're benefiting from the not only a global um, a global portfolio, but on top of that, we're going to give you additional exposure um, to those parts of the market that are the strongest. And finally, in the international bucket, we've tilted to China. We've had that um, that tilt on for a while. And China is the strongest, one of the strongest economies. Uh, and stock markets in the world right now. And you would, you would be benefiting from those tilts um, owning this portfolio, regardless of whether you owned uh, the most conservative portfolio or per perhaps the most aggressive, you would have these tilts in the portfolio. And then within the fixed income bucket, we're gonna give you exposure to high yield. Um, high yield right now uh, is yielding kind of between six and 7%. If you know that the 10-year bond right now is, is U.S. 10 years is, is giving you 70 basis points for 10 years, um, we're going to give you a yield that's 10 times higher than that. And uh, so, you, again, you're getting um, a slight tilt there. You're benefiting from the recovery of the U.S. economy. And then we actually have everything hedged back uh, to Canadian dollars. So you're not taking on any kind of FX risk. Uh, so you really do have as, as much as possible direct plays on the global economy with, um, with, with a, a, a currency hedged uh, out of it so that, you know, we're not um, at, at um, you know, at play for how, how uh, the currency markets may, uh, may move uh, while we're invested. And then I'll just um, finish with the performance slides. So if we look now uh, year to date, you can see um, again, these are the six versions. We tend to look at what's called a balanced portfolio or a 60-40. Um, you know, as, a, as a, a quick guide, if you will, the amount of fixed income we sort of think about as an as initial cut. Um, you take your age uh, and that would be your, the allocation that you should roughly have to fixed income as a starting point. Uh, obviously, everybody's scenario is slightly different. But you can see in the, in the case of the 60-40, um, which is right in the middle, it's called balanced growth. You can see that we're down like um, just over 1% uh, year to date. And, um, you know, TSX, I think, as of yesterday's close was down 9%. The, uh, the S&P 500, I think, is down 5% year to date. 
So you can see that these portfolios have held up very well. They've pr protected capital. And over time, that uh, balanced growth portfolio, if, if we look at it, generates kind of a 7% return. Um, so it, it sort of steady, plods along. You can sleep well at night. Um, and we, we sort of think of these portfolios as being kind of the core. Uh, and then you can add individual stocks or, or um, you know, so, sort of customize around it. But these really, we think of them uh, very much like pension-like in terms of global allocation, global diversification, using, um, using ETFs as a way to get really, really broad exposure and to, and to grow your capital, to grow your investment sort of prudently over time. I think I'll stop there. Those are really my prepared remarks. I'm more than happy to, um, to, uh, to, go, to, to go to questions. There's a, a slide on the team and then finally we'll, we'll land here. Um, we uh, hope you recognize uh, a, a couple of the people on this slide, but obviously David, Rahim, and, uh, and Jeff uh, have, are hosting this call, and uh, we're happy to turn it back to you, Jeff, uh, for questions. Just a quick question. Uh, every portfolio has some component of fixed income in there. Can you discuss the benefits of not only having fixed income, but the power of rebalancing, especially in cases such as this year? Yeah, that's a great question. So, yeah, we feel like, um, you know, many people uh, often think that they can take perhaps more risk than they really can. And so our guidance would be that you want to have some fixed income in each portfolio. Really, right now, fixed income is really um, a diversifier of risk. That's kind of how I would think about it. And what do I mean by that? I mean that when the market goes down, the fixed income component will hold in and provide some protection. With rates being as low as they are, unfortunately, you're really not gonna generate um, much uh, return at this point um, from that fixed income component. So it almost behaves like cash at this point if you're generating 70 to, you know, 70 basis points to 100 basis points or, you know, said differently, 1%. We really don't think you're gonna get much of a return um, and, and, and really is, you know, if you look at the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve is going to is guiding to lower rates for longer. So we don't see really rates going up um, in the medium term. So fixed income really is a is a breaker. And then when you have um, an event like market pulling back, um, that's an opportunity to to rebalance or to take some of your fixed income which is held in, and to buy um, to, to to buy equities that maybe have have been hit. So an opportunity to 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 buy um, equities as they pull back. So, yeah, we think that uh, fixed income is a, is, a, is a really good diversifier of risk and not necessarily um, a source of, of alpha or of, of return necessarily in the medium term. And then also I've noticed, uh, well, we've been overweight gold for some time. Uh, we are in a different dynamic. Uh, than many other years as, as every year evolves and changes. Can you just touch on the backgrounding of, or the background of gold, how it can fit into a portfolio, uh, not only as a, a birth, uh, sorry, a, a diversifier, but also a uh, alpha generator? Sure. Yeah, so um, gold is, is, uh, is a bit of a conundrum. You know, there's lots that's been written about gold in terms of, you know, a gent, uh, Warren Buffett, one of the greatest investors um, ever, has, has always been very critical of gold, saying that you know gold doesn't generate any cash flow. You, um, it has really no function or source. Uh, you, you, it has no like kind of functionality to it other than jewelry. Um, you know, you have to pay to store it. You know, if you have a lot of gold, you have to put it in a bank and you have to pay somebody to protect it. So, um, those are sort of the criticisms of gold. That what, what's, what's different in, uh, about gold now is that it's a real store of value. So because there's been so many challenges around the world, um, you know, banks and governments around the world have walked interest rates down to zero and in some cases negative. But if we just look at the Federal Reserve and we look at the fact that they're basically interest rates are at zero, then a layer on top of that inflation so if we think that inflation is maybe running at 
if you put cash in a in a or, or you, even if you invest um, in a bond or or just put cash in your bank account it really is not growing for you it's actually declining in its purchasing power and so people are making the decision and institutional investors are making the decision that rather than own cash where there's some kind of inflation drag on it so next year your cash that you may have put in the bank is worth a hundred dollars and now it's worth 98 and a year later it might be worth 93 or 95 if you put it into gold you have this kind of um, store of value and so what's really driving the price of gold and if you if you haven't looked at the price of gold gold is almost um, back to its all-time high so it's about 1800 right now the last time it was 1800 dollars in uh, an ounce was um, 2011 so kind of eight or nine years ago and uh, because real rates around the world are negative meaning you take the current rate less inflation is the real rate um, people are losing money and so they're putting money into gold as a way to hedge against inflation they hedge against negative real rates and that's driving uh, the price of gold up so while I'm not, a, I would not consider myself to be a gold bug. Um, I'm not necessarily positively disposed to gold. I am um, an investor and an allocator of capital globally. And the way that we are benefiting from, from the movement in the price of gold is to buy gold stocks. And in the case of this portfolio, we own an ETF that owns a basket of gold stocks. And gold companies are benefiting from a higher price in gold because obviously they're mining gold and then uh, being able to sell that gold at higher prices, generating a much um, a higher level of profit because really their costs haven't moved up the way that the price of gold has moved up. Hey, Kevin, uh, Raheem here, uh, great job. Uh, we have a uh, client uh, questions here. Uh, going through the first round of the pandemic and moving into COVID uh, 2.0, uh, and potential election uh, volatility ahead. And you're looking at uh, China, Hong Kong, and the US, uh, you know, playing a game of uh, chess per se. Yeah. How are you guys going to maneuver and tilt the portfolios to, uh, you know, most people look at these as, as potential detractors, but, you know, one person's detraction is another person's opportunity. How are you guys going to play the oncoming traffic per se and maneuver yeah. uh, as we move forward? Because these could also be seen as, as opportunities to take advantage of the bounce uh, as the market starts to absorb some of these things. Yeah, so those are, there's, there's a lot there. I would say that um, on the whole, the election, and I actually sent something out to, um, uh, to, to the advisors uh, across Canada today on um, on the election. So uh, right now, many of you would know that Biden is leading in the polls. Um, it's somewhat unusual for a sitting president not to be reelected in the second term. And the, typically the only time that uh, a sitting president is not reelected is during a recession. So very clearly we are in a recession, but it's a very different kind of recession than we've experienced before. Um, we think, or we, we, when you look at history, um, while there might be some disruption around market, be some volatility, we say, but, you know, the market might bounce around a little bit, pull back if Biden wins. Um, we don't really see a Biden win as uh, that disruptive um, to, to markets. And in fact, the market is already trying, is already kind of accepting the fact that Biden probably will win. And that's really on the back of Trump um, mismanaging um, the pandemic in the U.S. So if you look at where he's um, losing in the polls right now, it's in the states where the pandemic is is spreading and, and you know kind of at at peak in some states. So we don't we're not worried about the election. In fact, um, you know probably the only difference between a Trump election and a Biden election is just the speed at which taxes are going to go up. Um, everybody knows that taxes are going to have to go up because we're going to have to pay for the nine trillion dollars that they've 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 spent on the economy and, and they're contemplating another trillion uh, shortly. So um, there's no doubt that taxes are going to go up. 
um, it just depends on the speed at which they get implemented um, and, and who's kind of in, in power. Um, in terms of the, the conflict from, you know, between China and the US, um, it, you know, if they don't get a deal, what we've seen, the playbook for Trump is that he will put up um, uh, tariffs. And really, they, these two economies need each other. The US buys a lot of goods um, from China. That's, this is no surprise. Um, you know, so and China needs the US because they need somebody, they need a market to, to sell them. Um, you know, obviously tariffs, you don't take my word for it. You can just read about it anytime there's a tariff. It's really that that cost is borne by the citizens of that country and is less of a, a, a hurtful action, if you will, against, um, you know, its trading partner. We think that if Biden gets in, he would be much more friendly to China. Um, so again, that, that actually could be a positive. He won't be necessarily as abrasive um, the way uh, the Trump has been. So, you know, a Biden win might bring him um, taxes sooner, but there might be resolution or a, 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 you know, kind of a fresh pair of eyes on this trade deal. Um, so that actually could be a positive for markets. But ultimately, we think that these two trading partners, they need to work together. They need each other. And, uh, you know, this isn't the first time two nations have, uh, have kind of uh, disputed and uh, there's, there's always sort of resolution. So we, we're fairly confident that the market can work higher, um, whether Trump or Biden is in, in office. And in fact, you know, Biden in many ways on a global scale would be less confrontational than, than Trump would be, which might actually be incrementally positive for the market. Quick question. Uh, so Kevin, you run a pretty large investment team here, but I've uh, also won Lipper fund, uh, the Lipper Fund Award and we're awarded top investment mind, uh, top gun investment mind. What are the types of tools that go into your investment decisions? Uh, do you use quantitative, technicals, fundamentals? How do you make your decisions? Right. Good question. So um, my background, I was, I, I worked for HSBC. I was a commercial and corporate lender. So I'm very comfortable analyzing companies. Uh, as a lender, I, I lent money. So we would look at companies very differently. Then I moved into doing equity analysis where I, I had a, I earned my CFA or chartered financial analyst. In that case, we were evaluating companies, looking at them as equity investments and trying to determine what the values of those were. I worked, um, I work, I've worked for a small, a small investment management company, and then I worked for a hedge fund, and then I worked for um, for a very large Canadian bank, and uh, it was there that I was introduced to um, using uh, quants, so screening the market um, for various factors. So you're looking for companies that have, like, say, good, you know, good earnings growth, good ROE, so return on equity, return on invested capital, good balance sheet, sort of screening the markets in general, and then. Um, on top of that, I learned about technicals, which is really using um, price action and uh, in, 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 in price behavior and really human behavior to, um, to make uh, tactical decisions. So um, if somebody asked me what my investment style is or my investment approach is, it's very much um, what I would call multidisciplinary approach. Um, in the portfolios that we're talking about here on a global, um, on a global basis, we would use a lot more technical work because it's uh, incredibly difficult to determine, say, the intrinsic value of a, a basket of, say, gold stocks. Um, you know, what are all the gold stocks worth and then what should we pay for them? So we tend to use uh, momentum or technicals in, in, uh, in this portfolio, which helps us, pulls us into the strongest markets and the strongest sectors. Um, so we, we really use that. On other portfolios that we manage internally, where we're picking individual stocks, we would use much more of a multidisciplinary approach where we're looking at um, the market capitalization of that company, um, the technical nature of that company, and then we rely um, in some cases on the work that our analysts have done, um, on the news that's been reported, on the, um, on the on kind of the macro environment as well, uh, and uh, leverage uh, our strategists, as well as they look at um, more fundamental base. But uh, yeah, we, 
we uh, no no process works all the time. There's no strategy that works perfectly all the time, and so we try to be fairly balanced and using uh, different tools and and trying to generate kind of a, a, a steady return over over a period of time. Perfect. If there's any other questions, um, feel free to leave a note in the chat bar below. You're more than welcome to do it. Uh, direct them to either Raheem or myself. Uh, more than happy to ask them on your behalf. Uh, Raheem, anything else? Uh, just one last question on fixed income. Uh, you know, where is the positioning right now? Short term versus long term. Um, and in general, any uh, any sort of quick thoughts on uh, Canadian uh, movements and rates and, uh, and 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 volatility of fixed income uh, with uh, with uh, the economic forecast for Canada being revised. Yeah, I think. Um... You know, in the portfolio, we have uh, a short-term fixed income and, a, and the, call it a longer-term fixed income. That's a preset benchmark. We really don't move too far away from that benchmark. So short-term fixed income is, um, is defined as being under three years duration. And so, um, you know, right in, in that positioning there, what we've decided to do is, is put in a high yield component. We've done it for both long-term and, and short-term fixed income. Really what we're trying to capture there is with high yield, you're going to get, um, um, as the economy improves, you're going to get a benefit on the, um, on the underlining assets of so the bonds are going to trade better. And while you wait for that um, to improve or the spread to compress, you get a carry on the, um, on the yield, which is kind of in in the cases of short term, it's about four, about four and a half percent. In the long term bonds, it's more like six to seven. So we really like that trade because you get you get kind of paid to wait um, versus owning, you know, kind of government um, securities. I should say on those high yield um, high yield bonds, what we've done is the high yield market in Canada is quite thin and quite small. So those ETFs that we've put in there are using or investing in the high yield bonds of US companies. Um, but we've, we've hedged it back uh, so that, you know, in an improving environment, typically the US dollar would sell off. Um, you know, people will go into the US dollar as um, in, it's sort of a reserve currency. Well, it is a reserve currency and it uh, provides protection. So in a risk off environment or as the world improves, the US dollar tends to weaken. So we didn't want to put money into the US market and then only watch the US dollar fade against us. We hedged it. Um, in terms of positioning, I think if, if you have the flexibility, I would rather have you in, um, in a longer uh, duration. So if somebody's thinking about whether they should be shorter or longer term, I think you would want to be longer term meaning something longer than three year uh, duration. And I would rather you be in, in corporate credit or in high yield. The reason being is the US government is gonna need to raise a lot of money to pay for the, the, what they've spent. And when they come to market, there's a concern that right now, the 10 year yield is, is kind of 70 basis points or 75. And in order to encourage the bond, um, you know, the, the bond portfolio managers to buy their debt, they're going to need to pay up for that. So we think that the, uh, the yield is probably going to need to sneak up to maybe 100 basis points or 125 um, for bond managers to accept the, the increased supply and the risk associated with the U.S. market or the U.S. government issuing this debt. So we, like, we would prefer for, for people to be longer term you're going to get a higher yield. We would prefer people to be in credit or owning corporate um, or, or high yield debt rather than, than sovereign issuing debt, primarily because we know that the supply is going to come and bond holders are probably going to demand a higher price or a higher yield, which means price is going to sell off. So hopefully I've answered your question. 
quickly another one here uh, before we tie it off. Uh, some sources suggest that China may not be as strong financially as people think. Is this seen as political hype or what's your view on the take? Yeah, China is, uh, is tricky because, um, you know, we, we all know that the data is suspicious. Um, the collection is suspect, like the way that the data is collected. And so it's always a challenge to, to look at, um, you know, the data that, that's, that's coming out of, out of China and, and is published by the Chinese government. Um, you know, one of the things I joke about with, with others is that, you know, when, when we went through um, the COVID experience in China, you know, factories were shut down and there was no pollution. And then, you know, like you could see that from satellites. And now as China's come obviously back online, you know, there's pollution. So we know that there's a fair amount of activity. Uh, the other thing you can track is just shipping, et cetera. So we know we're fairly certain when we use, um, call it independent sources or sources that are um, tracking trade with China independent of, of their economy uh, or, or internally um, published data that, that definitely their economy is, is improving. Um, in terms of uh, um, you know, the, the financial stability of China, uh, you know, they're one of the largest holders of, um, of a U.S. Um, uh, government bonds. You know, they, are, they, they run trade surpluses with the rest of the world. Um, they trade with everybody. So they're, they're in a very, very strong position. They sell goods to the rest of the world. The rest of the world pays them. Um, they have reserves. And, um, you know, their, their challenges are really more social and economic internally than they are financial. Um, so it's, uh, um, it's more about um, managing the, um, you know, the, the, the improving um, wealth uh, of, of the average individual in that country and, and making sure that they have an ability to work and, you know, they're, they're achieving um, a certain measure of, of livelihood. Uh, obviously, you know, Hong Kong is a bit of an irritant, but in a, in a nation where there's a billion people, uh, there's about 7 million people or so, 8 million people in, in uh, Hong Kong. This is a bit of a, a rounding error when you're trying to manage a nation of, of uh, you know, over a billion people. So um, I don't have much of a concern for China. They have a lot of firepower uh, in terms of stimulating their economy. And when they do stimulate their economy, um, all the countries around China benefit. So that whole emerging market, whether it's India, whether it's Singapore, anybody that trades with them, um, you know, Taiwan, that whole, you know, pan- Asian um, area just benefits immeasurably when China stimulates their economy. So um, it's one of the reasons why we have a, a fairly large, we, we have a, a, a bet on the, or a tilt on the, in the portfolio into China. Um, but I don't have a, a, a really a, a concern about the financial uh, well being of China at this point. Perfect. Thank you for that. And thank you very much for your time, Kevin. Uh, All right. And uh, we'll be sure to reach out and have you guys out again. Uh, for everyone else that was calling in, uh, please check your emails in the coming day. We'll send you uh, the callback information or the dial in replay um, and have it posted to our Facebook page. Uh, give it a follow facebook.com slash mywealthmanager.ca. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Dave, Raheem, or myself. We're more than happy to reach out to Kevin. He's been a phenomenal tool and asset to our team. And uh, with that, uh, call it a day. All right. Have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks a lot, everyone.